Welcome to OVBC 2020. We're lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Valadon. Uh, we just talked a little bit about um, ASC credentialing um, and that entire process and key um, and um, uh, significant portion of that is around making sure that uh, the processes for the total joint movement to the outpatient setting um, have been well done. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of your, your perspective on, you know, how do you select patients for an outpatient setting for total joints? Uh, very interesting topic. Um, and this is a topic that has been evolving, uh, honestly, for the last uh, 20 years, uh, which well. is when we, uh, when we first heard of uh, a, uh, a wish to really decrease the, uh, the hospital stay okay. uh, for total joints. So patient selection has really uh, changed um, and has been refined um, over time. Currently, um, I gotta say, the, the amount of work that has been done uh, has been uh, fantastic. And I think we, we have made great strides in really identifying some of the uh, potential issues uh, that would uh, really decrease our success uh, sure. for patients. Again, we can define success in many different ways. Right. Uh, we have heard today, as a matter of fact, about uh, that how that can be measured, yeah. and, uh, and many times it's in the eye of the beholder. But certainly on the on the clinical side, uh, we have some direct uh, evidence that can uh, lead us to uh, uh, better outcomes. Starting with uh, a body mass index. Again, this is a, a topic that has been looked at uh, in depth. Uh, yeah. uh, BMI, we know, uh, over 40 uh, has been associated with uh, uh, lesser success and more complications uh, than anything under 40. So that's something that you know we, we like to take a look at. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea, as a matter of fact, it's a huge topic that has been discussed both in the sleep medicine community as well as the anesthesia community. Uh, we really strongly uh, need patients to be treated uh, for sleep, uh, sleep apnea to decrease complications. Um, smoking, uh, directly related to uh, successful uh, total joints. Um, uh, any uh, issues with co uh, coagulopathy, as an sure. example. Uh, has also been uh, discussed, and there's plenty of evidence uh, on that end that uh, it decreases the success. And uh, uh, last but not least, um, uh, hyperglycemia, okay. so uh, diabetes management. Sure. We also know that typically hemoglobin of uh, A1C, hemoglobin A1C over 7.5, uh, zero. Uh, some people use 6.8, uh, which is a little more strict, uh, can lead to decreased success uh, in that population. So, uh, again, the, and these are basic rules uh, yep. for which we have evidence uh, in the total joint population. Above and beyond that, there's plenty of other comorbidities that need to be uh, checked sure. and, and optimized sure. uh, for success. Um, and, uh, and not only that, on the clinical side, we need first and foremost to have a motivated patient uh, with the appropriate infrastructure at home right. for support. Right. Uh, if we do not have any of those two, any comorbidities can be well controlled, we're not gonna succeed. So um, a lot of work that really needs to be done uh, in this area. Uh, we have been talking about enhanced recovery, uh, of course, for these patients. Uh, in, my, in my mind, uh, Enhanced recovery really has many of the principles uh, based on uh, efficient outpatient perioperative management. So uh, we need more data uh, when it comes to hips yep. and uh, uh, nutrition uh, ahead of time. Sure. A lot more data that is needed, but it's, it's very interesting uh, the way uh, we're going at it, um, as well as all the developments uh, with uh, regional anesthesia, as an right. example. We are. I mean, leap years ahead. Uh, now, when you we when you think about a total joint, what just I'm you know as an orthopedic surgeon, I have a small brain. Tell me, you know, what's the preferred anesthesia? All things being equal, is it a spinal? Is it sedation and regional? Uh, is it is it general? Like, help, help me walk through your kind of preferred decision making in the outpatient setting. So, uh, very good question, and this is something that we uh, we face almost on a daily basis. Yes. Um, what we do know, and there's plenty of evidence out there for this, is that a multimodal uh, analgesic approach to total hips is what's going to make it successful. What I mean by that is that you really need to uh, treat pain yep. before it occurs, and you need to be aggressive 
uh, in treating post-operative pain. Okay. So, and when you treat post-operative pain, uh, again, there's many different ways, many different paths that you can um, uh, combat pain, if, sure. you, if you will. So that multimodal approach is really absolutely key uh, for success. Um, that being said, we're dealing about we're dealing with the pain management, uh, the anesthetic itself. Uh, interesting discussion, um, and I can tell you they both work. Okay. Uh, there are doing a spinal anesthetic uh, is certainly very reasonable uh, yep. to to do, uh, depending on the speed of the surgeon, depending on the complexity of the case. Yep. It's the type of spinal that uh, uh, that you can use, and many people do. Uh, general anesthesia, of course, uh, depending on the, at the data that you look at, uh, some of the data shows a very slight uh, increase in complications in some studies, not in all. Right. Uh, personally, um, I strongly prefer to do general anesthesia because spinals can actually uh, lead to some untoward complications that I'd rather not deal with. Right. Um, in the urinary retention being one of them, number one, and number two, uh, residual weakness when we get into recovery. Got it. So uh, if we're really aiming for quick ambulation, and That's what right. I mean by that is within typically 30 minutes yep. of getting into recovery, yeah. uh, my enemy will be residual weakness. That's right. That's right. And so we, we'd rather not deal with that on yeah. a potential fall or anything like for the patient. So now, now do you do you rely on uh, in your setting or um, in, in your kind of uh, preferred situation to have the surgeon using some type of local anesthetic delivery, intracapsular around the soft tissues, that yes. kind of, especially if you're going to prefer a general anesthetic, it would seem like the general anesthetic would allow early wake up and early mobility and the intraoperative anesthetic uh, multimodal strategy would allow pain control. That seems like it would be a good partnership. No doubt. Okay. Uh, partnering with the surgeon for, for good pain control is absolutely essential. Uh, in our practice, um, and again, not because I have any, any stock in the company or sure, anything sure. else, but certainly uh, using uh, slow release bupivacaine, uh, yep. expiral, is has really changed uh, our practice Interesting. Uh, significantly. Uh, now the injection of the expert again n needs to be needs to be in a very specific way. Right. Um, it's not just uh, periarticular uh, injection. It really needs to be done in very specific sites uh, for it to work. But it really it works beautifully. Yeah. The other thing, as an example, for uh, for total joints. I mean, I'm sorry, for total knees yep. rather. Um, doing an eye pack block hmm. uh, has really also transformed the uh, uh, our our recovery yeah. uh, from total needs. Tell me a little bit more about that. What is the IPAC block specifically? So uh, it is a uh, an injection, a local anesthetic done on the ultrasound, uh, inferior to the public teal okay. uh, artery and yep. behind the knee and above the knee capsule. So it's more of a uh, feel block, yeah. if you will. So you yeah. do it on the ultrasound. Once the, knee, uh, the needle is being retracted, you yep. inject local anesthetic and you deposit the local anesthetic. Uh, some of the potential downside, uh, if, you, um, if you inject too much local anesthetic uh, or if it spreads, yep. you can have a foot drop. Sure. Now, it's temporary, of temporary, course. Temporary, right, yeah. But uh, it is a fantastic, fantastic block huh. uh, to be done. Now, uh, overall, since we talk briefly about uh, quality metrics yeah, absolutely. and um, how we measure that. I'm a strong believer, A, you can only change what you can measure. Right. Uh, so w w what is success uh, to me or to a surgeon or to a patient can look very different. Um, being able to get a patient home for, for some might be success. Not, not necessarily uh, right. um, in, in our era. Uh, today, you really need to have uh, a long-term uh, view on on how to get patients through. It could sure. be 30 days. It could be, as a matter of fact, closer to 12 months um, for implants. Right. And that is that is data that needs to be reported. Right. So, in terms of quality metrics, again, uh, we we have several uh, clinical metrics uh, that we that we look at. But my my point in bringing that up is that we must absolutely must incorporate. Sure. Uh, return to a daily activities or something that the patient wants. Right. Um, otherwise, it's, it's 
it, it's not as good. Is yeah, that, yeah. What thing. are we doing? If we're if we're playing for the short run win and we're and we're doing worse for our patients in the long run, that's obviously not what we want to do. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for stopping by. Incredible opportunity. Great talk. Looking forward to seeing you some more.